Someday I shall spend in God's city to receive bright treasures I've won. Oh, but how can I ever accept them till I thank Him for what He has done? In that city when life's race is run Oh, but how can I keep from crying When I thank Him for what He has done When I thank Him for what He has done Can't shout hallelujah before I can sing that sweet song. I must kneel at the feet of Jesus and thank Him. And shout hallelujah Before I can sing that sweet song I must kneel at the feet of Jesus about Thanksgiving is that we don't have to wait till we get to heaven. We can thank him now, but I believe that'll be a special time when you and I kneel at the feet of Jesus and because then we'll have perfect understanding. We'll have perfect worship there. You know, things hinder us sometimes from worshiping. And uh, this morning, I, I didn't know if I'd be able to come to church or not. I was sick for the last two days. And I just turned my face toward the wall like Hezekiah did. And I said, Lord, if you would be a Please to allow me to go to church. I'll give you praise. And so that's what I want to do this morning. 
give him thanksgiving and give him praise. Good to be in God's house this morning. Appreciate each and every one that's with us. If you're visiting today, you're our special guest. And we want you to feel welcome in the house of God. And we'll do everything in our power to make you feel welcome. But I tell you, the best way to feel welcome is to allow He, the Holy Spirit, just to lead you and to guide you. If you'll be obedient to Him, I'll guarantee you, He'll make you feel welcome here this morning. I'm going to ask our ushers if they'll come at this time. We're going to receive our morning tithes and offerings. Let's bow our heads as we pray together. Father, we're so thankful this morning that we have the privilege to come together as your people. And like David, Lord, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And I pray, Father, that everything that we do today, Lord, it'll bring honor and glory unto you. I pray, Father, that you'll bless this offering. Lord, I'm thankful that, uh, Lord, that you allow me to give back a portion of that that you've given to me. And, and Lord, I pray today that it'll be used for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand and help the choir to sing as we receive the offering today? deep despair they took a boat they had kept repaired and they went back to fishing thinking they were all alone a farmer known as a godly man was called to preach and leave his land so he followed God and served him faithfully but later on, he never saw the yield He used to see in his cotton fields And he went back to farming And he wept with bitter tears Burn the boat, burn the plow So you don't ever turn around When God won't answer and your fat back's against the wall. That old life you lived before, you left behind to serve the Lord. Trust in Him and stay committed to His call. Pray from deep inside, Lord, I surrender all. The disciples saw the risen Lord 
and rejoiced to hear his call. And the farmer saw what they did. Keep the faith and say, Lord, I surrender all. I surrender. So Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things that are before. For God's people, there's nothing. If we was able to turn back, there's nothing to turn back to. I can't brag about anything that I did before I met the Lord. I can't brag about anything that I've done since I've met the Lord, but I can brag on what he's done for me. He's a gracious God. If you have your Bible, Revelation chapter 22. As you're turning, there'll be a spaghetti lunch, April the 28th, right after uh, the church service. And everything will go toward our mission trips. We have uh, three different countries that we're going to do mission work in this summer. And uh, if you want to uh, get a ticket for that uh, lunch, you can do so after church this morning. In the lobby, Mariah will be uh, assisting in getting those tickets to you. And also this morning after church, we'll be having a missions uh, team com- uh, meeting. And uh, so do be sure to remember that if you're on our missions team. Revelation chapter 22. Would you stand with me today as we honor God's word? Beginning with verse 6, and we'll read down through verse number 9. And he, and Jesus, said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them, When I'd heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou doest it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Lord, I pray this morning that you'll use me to preach your word. Lord, I know that, uh, Lord, that you're going to return one day, and Lord, our work on earth will be over, so help us to be faithful in whatever time that we have left, Lord, to share the gospel with those that need to know Jesus. I pray that you'll help me today to preach. And Lord, for that, I'll be most grateful, giving you the praise and the honor and all the glory in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. You can be seated. I want to share with you today the closing thoughts of John as he concludes the book of the Revelation. He's on the Isle of Patmos. He's there as a criminal, but the only crime that he's guilty of is trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. He's about 90 years old when this book was written. He's the last surviving disciple of Jesus. All the others, most of them, in fact, probably all of them, have met martyrs' death. In this letter, God gives John a vision of the future. And he writes down those visions so that you and I, that we can be encouraged 
that for God's people, we have a bright future. It's not a dark future for the people of God. It's a bright future. And in, these closing, in this closing chapter, John reiterates some things that he believes. And so this morning, I want to preach on the thought. Uh, John believed, and so do I. And I want to share with you, as he concludes this book, the thoughts that he has. First of all, John believed in the inevitable return of Christ. You see, the Old Testament message was, He is coming. The Gospels, they shared the message, He is come. And then from Acts through the book of the Revelation, the message is, He is coming again. I firmly believe that He could come at any moment. There's nothing left on the prophetic calendar that needs to be fulfilled for our Lord to make His return. What takes place when he comes is that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we that are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. This is why that I believe in his inevitable return. First of all, the signs point to it. Jesus said that what would happen preceding his return would be as the days of Noah and as the days of Lot. They were days, as you read, the uh, scriptures, they were days of violence, days of impurity, days of immorality, and days of sexual perversion. We're seeing those. In fact, it's coming down the a road like, a, like a, a, a locomotive. Things are taking place right now that points to his soon return. Very soon, the Supreme Court will make a judgment on whether or not marriage is just between man and woman. And who would have thought just a few years ago that we would ever get to that point? That's the way it was in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot. There's an agenda in our country that tries to shove immorality and impurity down our throats. Paul described the last days like this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. It's a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they will heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. Jesus described the days before he returned in Matthew chapter 24, verse 6 through 8. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. These are the beginning of sorrows. That word sorrows there is the word that we get our English word labor pains from. And what Paul or what Jesus is saying here is that like labor pain, the events that precede the last day that they will come closer and closer together and with greater intensity. These are the days of sorrow. I believe that his return is inevitable because the signs point to it. And secondly, I believe that his return is inevitable because the scriptures prophesy it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 7, the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Then Jesus himself, in the beginning of the book of the Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, verse number 7, Behold, he cometh quickly with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Three times in Revelation 22, Jesus speaks these words, I come quickly. The Apostle Paul refers to these events that takes place when Jesus comes back again as our blessed hope. So I believe that, uh, dear friend, in his inevitable return, because the signs point to it, secondly, the Scriptures prophesied. In 2 Thessalonians 1 and 7, he's coming with my angels. And then, thirdly, I believe that his coming is inevitable because the Savior promises it. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 30, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power 
and great glory. Remember what Jesus said the night before he gave his life as a ransom for our sins? He said this in John chapter 14, John, verse 1 through 3. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Do you remember when Jesus uh, ascended into heaven? The disciples are standing on the Mount of Olives, gazing upward, and an angel appears to them in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 11 and said, uh, Why stand you here gazing into heaven? This same Jesus that you see taken into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. I believe in his inevitable return. I've asked Lonnie to do something for me this morning. Lonnie, would you come? I, I'm going to ask him to sing, and I'm going to ask you to help him to sing the chorus of this because the songwriter says it well. I want you to stand this morning with me just for a moment. I believe in his inevitable return, that he's coming again. And if Lonnie will just lead us in that song, I, you sang the chorus with him this morning. High upon a mountain, from where he ascended, an angel of the Lord declared that it would be. He said, don't stand there grieving for the one you see leaving in like manners coming back for you and me. Everybody's singing. And I believe he's coming back like he said. I believe that the trumpet's going to sound so loud one day it'll wake the dead in the twinkling of an eye he'll split the eastern sky and I believe he's coming back like he said I believe the time is nearing yes. I believe the time is nearing that we'll soon see his appearing. Oh, this might be the hour. Oh, this might be the day Ooh, when the saints of every nation will lose their gravitation and in the middle of the air be called away and I believe he's coming back like he said I believe that the trumpet's gonna sound so loud one day it'll wake the dead in the twinkling of an eye he'll split the eastern sky and I Coming back like he said. I believe the time is near when we'll soon see his appearing. Oh, this might be the hour. Oh, this might be the day. Oh, yes. <laughs> when the saints of every nation will lose the gravitation and in the middle of the air be called away and I believe he's coming back like he said I believe that the trumpet's gonna sound so loud one day it'll wake the dead in the way split the eastern sky and I believe he's coming back like he said Amen
man. I believe in his inevitable return. He's coming again. He made us a promise that he would come again for us. And I, I believe that promise. Like John, I believe. And then secondly, I believe like John. I believe in his inspired revelation. John talks about that in verse number 6. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. Jesus confirmed the inspiration of Scripture. Our Lord is the one that said, Heaven and earth may pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. He said to the devil, He said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And then the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews 4 and 12, he said, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints of marrow. And, and he said that it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Then Paul, as he writes to that young preacher Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, he said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And because the scriptures are inspired by God, first of all, we should hold it faithfully. That simply means that we ought to believe what the Bible says. We don't have to understand it, but we've got to believe it. We should hold it faithfully. I'll be honest with you, I have more patience for a full-fledged atheist than I do for somebody that says, well, I believe part of the Bible. I just don't believe all the Bible. I'm telling you, if you believe just part of the Bible, that probably means that you're going to go ahead and throw out the parts like the virgin birth and the sacrificial death and the bodily resurrection. And if we throw those out, we might as well go ahead and get a realtor company to come in and put a for sale sign out in front because if that's true, that part of the scripture can't be trusted, then which parts can be trusted? Oh, dear friend, there are those that like to rip the miracles out of the Bible. But I want to go on record this morning and say this. I want to be crystal clear. I believe in the God that spoke this world into existence in six literal days. I believe that God told Noah to build an ark. I believe eight people got into that ark and they survived a catastrophic Blood. I believe that Samson killed a bunch of people with the jawbone of a donkey. I just believe God's Word. I believe that Jesus walked on water, that Jesus turned water into wine. I believe Jesus cleansed the leper, and he opened the eyes of the blind, that he gave hearing to the deaf, and that he opened the mouth of the mute. I believe that Jesus cast out demons. I believe Jesus resurrected Jairus' daughter, and then resurrected himself on that third morning. I believe that everything in the Bible actually and literally happened just like it's written down. Oh, we should hold to the, hold to the Word of God faithfully, and then we should hide it regularly. I tell you, if we get excited about the Word, and we do around here, I, then you and I, we ought to do, I, like the psalmist said, hide his words in our heart that we might not sin against God. The psalmist said in Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the way of sinners, nor standeth in the way of sinners, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Dear friend, when I meditate in the Word of God, it's simply because I have hid His words in my heart. Oh, dear friend, I believe in His inspired revelation, and because of that, we should hold it faithfully, we should hide it regularly, and we should heed it obediently. Blessed, verse 7, is the man that keepeth the sayings of this prophecy. Like James said, it's not the hearers of the Word that's justified, it's the doers. We should heed it obediently. It's not a book that's just been given merely for information, but it's been given for illumination that there might be a transformation take place. Oh, I believe, dear friend, in his inspired revelation, 
And I, thirdly, we should herald the word of prophecy passionately. The word of God. Verse 10, and he saith unto me, seal up the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. John, don't sit on your hands, but tell everybody that you run into that I'm coming again, that they can trust my word. Oh, I'm glad today that we've got the word of God. We ought to teach it and preach it without apology. We don't owe anybody an apology. I've noticed in recent days on social media is that folks are apologizing because we believe in the sanctity of marriage. We don't have to apologize. God made that decision. It's not man's decision. It's God's decision. You don't have to apologize. You ought to be kind, but don't ever apologize for what God has said in his word. Don't ever give up that ground. That's God's ground. Marriage has been established upon the Word of God. And we don't owe any apology. I tell you, men of God ought to stand and preach the Word of God without favor and not worry about uh, being popular. We've not been called, my friend, uh, to be popular. We've been called to be men of God. I've read about some churches where that the preacher has to submit his message to a board has to be approved before he can preach that message. In fact, I heard about a preacher this past week that, that the church called him as pastor, and they gave him three pages of requirements where he could preach, when he could preach. I'm telling you this uh, morning, uh, um, a man that won't preach the Word of God simply because God's called him to preach ought not ever to be called as a pastor. If you want to be in a church that preaches God's Word passionately, or if you don't want to believe there, be there, let me just say this this morning. This church is not for you. I'm going to preach it passionately. With every ounce of uh, uh, strength that's in my being, I'm going to stand flat-footed and declare the Word of God. God didn't call me to appease the crowd. God didn't call me to be politically correct. God called me to be biblically correct. And that's what I intend to do. We ought to preach the Word of God without apology. And then we're to preach the Word of God without addition. Listen to what he says in verse 18 of that same chapter. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If somebody comes along and says, I've got a new prophecy, I've got a new word, I've got a new vision, I had a new revelation, you ought to be careful around folks like that. When a man adds to the word of God, he's standing on dangerous ground. A lot of folks, they'll take busloads of people to go hear somebody like that. We're not to add to the Word of God. We're to preach it without addition and teach it without addition. For example, the Book of the Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, as they call it. God says, don't add to my Word. They equate it with the Bible. There's nothing that equals the Bible. It's in a league all by itself. There's just one book that contains the Word of God, and it's the Holy Scriptures that I have before me this morning. What about the writings of the Watchtower Society, the Jehovah False Witnesses? God says, don't add to my Word. What about those, that, uh, these uh, uh, preachers that uh, add revelations and visions and dreams and, and all like that? God says, don't add to my Word. And so we're to preach the Word of God without addition. We're to preach thoroughly the Word of God without amendment. Verse 19, and if any man shall take away the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. In other words, don't skip over any of it. From, Revel from Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22, it's all the Word of God. Just because... We don't like it. You remember in Jeremiah's day when the king took a penknife and cut out the parts that he didn't like? Jeremiah just went back and wrote it again. 
Amen. You can't take away from the Word of God. Well, I believe in His inevitable return. I believe in the inspired revelation of Scripture. Then thirdly, I believe in His incredible redemption. John says in verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Notice the word, come. First time that it's mentioned is in Genesis chapter 7 and verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou in all thine house. Isaiah 1 and 18, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Jesus said to the disciples, Suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me. Then he says, in John chapter 7 and verse 37, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Said to the disciples, Come and follow me. Oh, that separates Christianity from all other religions. The word of the Christian is, Come. Our Savior says, Come. Word of the cults. The false religions of today is, Do. You've got to work your way in. My Bible says the way that I folks get saved is they come to Jesus Christ and that whosoever shall confess him as Lord shall be saved. That's what my Bible teaches. Call for Christians has come. Oh, to the virgin and to the harlot alike, Jesus says, come to the thief and the moral man, come. To the rich and poor, come. Oh, to the slave and to the king, come. To the religious and irreligious, Jesus says, come. To the Baptists and to the Pentecostal and the Presbyterians and the church of God. I'm telling you, Jesus says, come. That's his word to you and I. Are you hungry for meaning for your existence? Come, dear friend, and, and come to the feet of Jesus. You'll discover that you're here for a purpose, for a reason. You're not an accident. You're not because there was a big bang and, and everything then came into existence, had no outside power. I'm telling you, Jesus spoke this world into existence. We're to believe that. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, Christ also hath suffered once for sins, just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. Oh, when he died on the cross for me and you, the righteous demands of a holy God were eternally satisfied against my sins. Spirit says, come. The bride, the church says, come. And whosoever will, let him come and take the waters of life freely. Oh, I believe in his inevitable return. I believe he's coming back just like he said. I believe in the inspired revelation. I believe in his incredible redemption. And then I also believe in his indisputable reign. Behold, I come quickly, verse 12 and 13, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Verse 16 says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things unto the church. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and the morning star. Jesus says some things about himself in those two verses. First of all, there's a reference to his deity. That he is God in flesh. And that separates Christianity from cults. They say that he uh, was a good teacher, but he wasn't God. Can I just take two verses and prove to you this morning that he was God? In the book of the Revelation, verse 6, the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels. The Lord God sent his angels. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel. Sent my angel. Is the angel the angel of God? Or is the angel the angel of Jesus? The answer is yes. And then he says this in verse 13. 
Jesus said, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. But you can turn back one chapter to chapter 21 and verse number 6. And God says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, who is the Alpha and the Omega? Who is the beginning and the end? Is it God or is it Jesus? Again, the answer is yes. You know the reason that they could both say that? They're both God. God incarnate. And so we see the reference to his deity. You know, John, the revelator, is also the John of the Gospel of John. And when you turn to that book, he's captivated with the deity of Jesus Christ. In fact, he just gets right down to the point, right off the bat. When you open the gospel, there's no boyhood, there's no bloodline, there's no baptism, and there's no Bethlehem. He doesn't mention any of those. And then in the opening verses, there's no star, there's no stable, there's no shepherds, and there's no singing. No, he gets right down to his point. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's captivated by his deity. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I read where one preacher put it this way. Before the beginning of the beginnings began, Jesus was wasing like he'd always been wasing. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's not good grammar, but that's good theology. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus under, John understood that Jesus is the God of creation, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He's the Jesus that Paul talked about in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For by him were all things created. They're in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is, a, he is before all things. Talking about our Lord. Jesus said, I'm Alpha and the Omega. I'm God. He said, I'm the beginning and the end. I'm God. He speaks of his deity. And then it speaks of his humanity. I'm the root and the offspring of David. I was before David, and I'm after David. Like Abraham says. Dear friend, he talked about God, and Abraham rejoiced to see his day, and he saw it, and he was glad. Jesus revealed himself in many different ways down through the centuries. Noah saw him as an ark. Moses saw him as a ram, or Abraham saw him as a ram in a thicket. Jacob saw him as a ladder. Moses saw him as a serpent on a stick in the wilderness. David saw him as a shepherd. Job saw him as the redeemer that ever lives. Ezekiel saw him as the wheel in a wheel. Hosea saw him as the lover of the unfaithful. Amos saw him as the plumb line. Malachi saw him as the son of righteousness rising with healing these wings. Oh, Joseph saw him as the one that would save his people from their sins. Simeon, remember Simeon taking that little baby Jesus into his arms? Simeon saw him as the light to the nations and the glory of Israel. The greatest identification had to be that of John the Baptist. He'd already said, there's coming one after me that I, of whom I'm not worthy to loosen his shoes. And then Jesus came walking one day by the river of Jordan where John the baptizer was baptizing. John identified him that day as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He speaks of his victory. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He was in the beginning. He'll be victorious in the end. He'll be the last one standing. Old country preacher, 
was in his study one day studying the Word of God. A seminary professor came in and he asked him, said, what are you studying? He said, I'm studying the book of the Revelation. And the seminary professor said, you can't understand that book. It's filled with symbolism, figures of speech. You'll never understand that book. The old country preacher looked at him. He said, I know exactly what this book means. Jesus wins. That's the message of the revelation. Because he wins, you and I win. We have victory through him, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Connie, come lead us in a song. That's the message. John believed, and so do I. I believe in his inevitable return, I believe in his inspired revelation. I believe in his indisputable reign that he is God incarnate, God in flesh. I believe all those things. I hope you do. You can't be saved apart from believing the Word of God. You can't work your way into heaven. You can take all the good deeds of every person that ever has lived and ever will live and put them all together, and it wouldn't be enough good works to earn one person's salvation. The word of our Lord is to you this morning. It's come. Come unto me. Come, let us reason together. The word of our Lord is come, follow me. We're going to stand this morning. We're going to sing. We've got folks that are at the front. They'll be glad to come and pray with you today if you need help. i tell you what I'm going to do. I, I heard this from a, a preacher that I'm going to try to get here this year, if it's possible, he's a prayer coordinator. And I like the way he done things. I'm just going to try it out this morning. I'm going to borrow uh, something that he uses in his sermons for the invitation. And listen to me carefully. If you just need to come and pray about something, you don't need anybody's help. You just need to pray. You don't want anybody to come around. It's not that you don't want them, but it's just between you and God. And you just want to talk to him about something. Then I want you to come over to this side right here. Bow right here. And folks will leave you alone. They'll know that you just need to talk to God. If you need to come to the Lord for a need in your life, and you would like for somebody to pray with you, maybe somebody to help you, to share with you what the Word of God says that you need to do. Then I'm going to ask you to come over here. And there'll be people here in this church that'll be glad to come and pray with you. If you don't need anybody to pray with you, but you need to pray, come right here on this side. If you need some help, need some folks to come alongside of you, to pray with you, I'm going to ask you to come right here. As we sing, If you need to come for whatever reason,